Okay, welcome to the Physics 110 lab, Simple Harmonic Motion. So we're going to uh, record a little bit of information here at the beginning, uh, explaining in some detail about a couple of the equations there, and then we'll work our way through the experiment itself. So I'll walk through the steps. I'm going to record data, and then I'll share with, uh, that with you later um, for you to do the analysis. So simple harmonic motion is something that uh, uh, is well studied in physics and we use simple harmonic motion to model many, many things in nature um, because it's something that we understand pretty well. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of things approximate simple harmonic motion. So these equations you see are used quite often in uh, various degrees of uh, complexity in physics. So when we look at, the, at something like a spring, Okay, so if I take a spring here, and if I stretch the spring and release it, it returns back. Okay, so in other words, there's a force in this direction. Now, some springs you can compress, and then when you release them, they come back out in the other direction. If I pull this in one direction, it'll be pulled back to where it was originally. Or if I have a spring that I can compress, then it will try to go back to what its original position was. So they refer to this as a restoring force. Um, there is an equation known as Hooke's Law. Um, which relates this force to the distance. So in other words, the greater the distance that I stretch this, the larger the force is. And you know this by working with uh, uh, springs. If I pull it like this and release, it goes back with a little force. If I pull it further and release, it's going to go back even harder, so to speak, but at a larger acceleration. And this is true um, for, for most springs um, up to a certain point. Obviously, we could stretch the spring and deform it and overcome its physical properties. Then it would no longer obey Hooke's law. But within the realm of reason here the, uh, for what we're going to use, uh, that law works very well. So they have summarized that law for our uses in equation one uh, in the lab manual. So this shows delta W equals K delta X. Normally, Hooke's F equals negative kx, uh, and which x means the displacement, how far it's been pulled or compressed from its uh, uh, equilibrium position. And then the force would be how large that force is going to be. And there would be a negative sign in Hooke's law because it's going to be pulling it back in one direction or, um, um, or pushing it back out to the other direction. It'll all be opposite of whatever direction you're pushing or pulling it. The force will always be opposite of that, hence the reason why you'll see a negative sign in Hooke's law. Now, in this equation one, in the lab manual, they have absorbed this negative sign into the delta. So in other words, they're saying we're just going to look at the magnitudes here um, of k and by being able to look at the change in weight, um, and that's what the delta W is, so it's just the change in weight, how much mass we're hanging on the end, and then delta X will be our change in displacement. So we're going to look at these changes, so the negative sign would be absorbed in there, and then we're going to solve for K. So what is K? K is known as the spring constant. K is simply a measure of how strong the spring is, okay? So in other words, if K is larger, I, if I have two, two different springs, if I had one spring and K was larger, when I stretch this, say, 10 centimeters and release it, I would be able to calculate what the force would be. But if I had a stronger spring and I stretched it the same 10 centimeters, it would return with a greater acceleration with a larger force if the K value was larger. So it is simply just a measure of how strong the, the spring is. Okay, and the units on that are newtons per meter because we're normally going to have the forces in SI units that are going to be in newtons, and then the uh, distances will be in, in, uh, um, in meters. So the units for spring constants are typically given in SI units, newtons per meter. Okay, so if I were to have this particular spring governed by this force we were just talking about, okay, and I were to place a mass on this spring, you'll notice, of course, that it will stretch, obviously, because um, we're pulling it um, with a larger mass. And now we know that we've stretched the spring, okay, so that there is some force in the opposite direction. And it's balanced at this point by this force here. But if I were to place this in oscillation like so, you would then have both, so I'm giving it its initial uh, um, push, you have the force where it's pulling back up, 
um, once when it's stretching out, then the return force is back up. When it's compressing, the return force is back down. Okay, but and then we also have gravity to look at here um, as well if we were going to analyze the total system. But if you were to apply Hooke's law and Newton's second law together, and you could then rewrite that and solve it would be what's known as a differential equation. You could solve this out. You would find that that this particular motion here is sinusoidal. So, in other words, the equations that describe it, you can use sines or cosines in order to describe how, um, how this motion is going to be. And we could predict how long would it take for this to make one trip. In other words, start at one point, let's say at the bottom, go up and come back down and stop at that next, at the same point again. We could determine how long that time period is going to take. Interestingly, as long as I stay within reason um, uh, here and don't exceed things uh, like the, the um, physical ability of the spring, the amplitude does not typically matter when we're looking at the um, um, when we're looking at the time period. I do want to keep my there are some approximations being made here in the equations that we've got, so I do want to keep my oscillations, the amplitudes at a smaller um, at a smaller amplitude so that I can uh, do a better job with my errors, but um, not a big concern for you. Just understand that we're going to use small changes here, and these equations will work for small changes, um, and we're going to be able to put in the mass and the spring constant, and we're going to calculate what this time period is, theoretically, and then we're also going to do it experimentally. Okay? So, the steps for this are going to be is that we're going to place different known masses on here. We're going to calculate the force that they are applying to the spring. And we're also going to measure what the change in distance is. Then we'll be able to use the change in distance, the change in the weight, to be able to calculate what K is. Then once, and we'll have K values for several, uh, um, cal, uh, for several masses, then we'll take the average K value. Once we know that, we will then be able to uh, apply and plug that into the equation for the tension and we'll put different masses on here. Um, sorry, not for the tension, for the time period. We will put different masses on here and we will oscillate them. We'll measure with a stopwatch to see how long that time period is going to be. And we'll compare that to the calculation we make by plugging in the particular mass that we're using and um, the also part of the mass of the spring, we'll come back to that in a second, as well as the K value, the, the strength of the spring. All right. So one of the things to point out here is that when we are going to make these calculations, there will be two different masses we're going to consider. Okay. So we're going to have the masses that we hang off of here that will change from time to time. But there's also the mass of the spring. Because notice, if I take the spring and I lay it here, then that's its natural state. And you notice that it is not stretched. I could measure it here and, and compare. But when I place it along and hang it from here, we now have the weight of the spring and gravity is pulling it down. And so it's stretching the spring a little bit. And you'll notice that these are stretched. It's actually shaped so that these are stretched relatively uniformly. Um, whereas if I were to place it like this, it would stretch these out um, these would be stretched much further than the ones down here. Um, so if I place it in this manner, the, sp the string has stretched from its equilibrium position um, if I were laying it on the table. But now that we're hanging it here, we're going to let this be our starting position. Because we're looking at a delta, we mean we're looking at a change in position as well as the change in weight. So when we start to measure for our K value, I'm going to make measurements of the length of the spring. I'm going to start out with the total length of the spring, and then I'm going to begin hanging masses on the spring to stretch it. And then I'll, I'll measure this length again, and, event, and then I can subtract those two and figure out what the stretch was. And the only thing I care about in terms of mass is not the mass of the spring, only the mass that's hanging off of here for making the calculations for K, because the weight of the spring is already taken care of in our initial measurement of the length. Okay. However, when we go to the second part of calculating the periods, 
When I place this mass on here and I allow this to oscillate, it's not just this mass that's contributing to the oscillation, it's also some of the mass of the spring. If we look at equation three, actually, equation three shows big M, capital M, is going to be M plus M sub E, which is M plus one third M. So M sub S, sorry. So the M sub S means mass of the spring. So it would be the mass, hanging mass, plus one third of the mass of the spring. That substituted into equation two there for M. Then we would put in the K value that we found from doing the stretching earlier. Okay, so I'll repeat that later um, just to make sure that's clear. Okay, equation four is having to do with a pendulum. So we'll talk about that towards the end. It has the same form as the time period before, but we'll look at that at the very end. Okay, so <clears throat> let's move on now to the exercises. We're going to start with this suspended oscillator. Okay, so first I'd like to find the effective mass of the spring. If I place this here on the scale, I'll see that I get 161.8 grams. So dividing that by three is 53.93 grams. So I'm going to record that value, but of course we need to write down in kilograms. So this will be 0 0.05393 kilograms. And then I'm going to go ahead and hang this back up by the small end. And they're going to ask us to find the length of the spring with no mass. So in other words, what our starting initial position is going to be. So if I take this, and I actually try to bring it over this way so we can see it. And I'm gonna pick a point on the spring. The one that's most obvious here is going to be the bottom uh, of, of the spring, not this coiled piece, but I'm gonna use the, uh, the last wind of the spring here. I see that my length here is 20.1 meters. So that's 0 0.201 meters. All right, the next step is to look at the mass. Um, they have the data table here is going to suggest 200 um, grams or 0.2 kilograms. So I'm going to take a 200 gram mass as a starting one. I am going to suspend this here. So I get 43.2. So that would be 0.432 meters. And for the weight column, you'll take 0.2 and multiply by G um, in order to get, which would be 9.8, to get your actual weight, okay? So I'll let you do that in the analysis, and I will continue to record these down. So the next one would be 250 grams. So I'm gonna leave the 200 on here. I'm gonna grab this other 50 gram one, and we can hang it off. And we'll let it stretch a little further. Come back, measure this one more time. I see 49, 49.6. So it's 0.496 for the 250 grams. Now let's go to 300. So I'm gonna remove the 50, place 100. So this will be 300 grams. Okay, make this measurement. at 55.4. So that would be 0.554 for the 300. And we have 350, so I'll go ahead and add another mass on. Try to keep it from oscillating. I'm using my finger to sort of lightly touch that to dampen the oscillations. Well, at the same time, indexing from my finger from the top. And I see that it's 61.3. Okay, now we'll go to 400. So 
This will be our final measurement for the K value. And that is exactly 67.0. So 0 0.670, okay? So now, from that, you will be able to take the length with the mass, that column, and subtract each, uh, subtract 0 0.201 from each of those, and that will tell you the stretch. So you'll notice there's a stretch column here, and we are going to take the length with mass, subtract 0 0.201 each time, and find the stretch because 0 0.201 was our starting position. So we would take, for example, this last one that has 400 grams, I measured at 0 0.670. So 0 0.2 was my starting point, so 0 0.67 minus 0 0.2, that would give me my stretch um, uh, from uh, the initial position, okay, for the 400 grams, all right? So you'll calculate the weight, you will also calculate the stretch, then all you have to do is um, Take the weight in that, the, really the second column, first one you fill out there, but you take the weight column and divide by the stretch column, because that will be the change in weight, delta W, and then your stretch is delta X, and when you divide those, that will give you K. And so the spring constant goes in that next to last column of this first data table. Okay? Now, all right, so at that point, I am going to uh, measure an experimental period in the first table. We'll do that in just a moment. Then your theoretical period is what you would calculate for the second column, okay? So that second column, again, the theoretical period, if you look back in the equations, if we go back to the first part of the lab manual, the first page of this lab, equation two is how we're gonna calculate that theoretical period. So keep in mind, so you know how two pi, and you'll multiply it by the square root of m over k. So k is going to be the value you've got earlier um, by taking, after you calculated everything in that first data table and you calculated the spring constant, you'll take those five spring constants and, and find the uh, spring constants and find the average value of k. But you'll take that average value of k and you're gonna plug it into t every time, okay? So, in other words, if I'm looking at equation number two, all right, from the lab manual, this is the time period is going to equal to 2 pi, square root of m over k. The k here is going to be the average k value that you found um, by averaging the five k values calculated earlier. in the first table, okay? And then M, that's, up, that's in that equation, this M will be the total M. So in other words, it's going to be the hanging mass plus the effective mass of the spring, okay? So you'll calculate the mass divided by K, take the square root, Multiply by 2 pi, and that's going to give you your theoretical period, all right? Then we'll compare that with the percent deviations there. We're going to compare that um, to the experimental period. So let's go ahead and measure the experimental periods. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to begin a small oscillation. So I'm going to allow that to oscillate, okay? I'm going to step to the side. Perhaps I'll step over on this side so that we can um, turn our stopwatch on. And I'm going to wait. For me, I think the easiest point is I'm just going to wait till it's at the bottom. And every time it returns, I'm going to count. All right, so this will be start. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so I got 10.96 seconds for that. Second, so 1.096 for this. So this is the 200 gram mass. So this will be my experimental period. So it's 1.096. So let's go ahead and now add on the 50 gram mass. Okay, I'll start my oscillations again. I'll do the same, um, the same thing. So I'm going to reset here. So I'm going to start. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so I get 11.95, so we'll divide that by 10. And that's 1.195, of course, actually. Okay, so here's to be the embarrassing part where I'm supposed to be the expert, and I'm saying divide by 10, use my calculator. So just ignore that I did that. All right, so... Um, Let's jump ahead now to the 300 gram mass. I'm going to take the 50 off and put the 100 on with the 200. Okay, now oscillate that. And again, reset and start. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, 12.99, so divide by 10. 1.299 seconds. All right, so now we're gonna go to the 350, so that's three, so I'll just go ahead and add this 50 gram mass on. Gonna cause short oscillations here. And go ahead and reset and then a little bit large oscillations actually so I'm just gonna kind of there we go let that go in that sense and start that's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten thirteen point six eight for the ten 1.368 seconds. And now we'll go to the 400 grams, remove those, and just hang the 200 plus the other 200 here. This is going to be a little trickier. I'm going to have to do small oscillations so I don't hit the table. Okay, reset and start. One, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, of course, you don't have to do ten, ten trials. Um, you could do any number that you like. Um, eventually, if you go too long, that's 1.468 seconds for one period. But if you go too long, then um, it will dampen out eventually. So 10's a nice number, makes it easy to, uh, um, to calculate without a calculator. Um, so again, that was uh, um, kind of funny. All right, so I've told you how to calculate the theoretical period. You'll do the percent deviation between T, so you take that theoretical period minus the experimental, divided by the theoretical again, multiply it by 100, and that will be your percent deviation. All right, so you'll do that for all of those and see how close you are. You should notice a trend here that our um, experimental period got, uh, became longer as we increased the mass. Does that make sense? Well, if we look back at our equation, and we'll notice that in equation two, that if I were to, I'm gonna pick a different color here, if I were to go in and increase my mass, I would, of course, expect my time period to go up. So that makes, uh, assuming I keep the K value the same. All right. So the last thing they ask you to do here is they say construct a graph showing the squared period of oscillation as a function of the total mass of the system. Okay. So what they mean by this is when you say as a function of, you notice that there is a final column in that second data table that says ex experimental period squared. So in other words, take this first column of that second table, square it, and that will allow you to make a graph. A quick little sketch here in red. So that would put T squared on the y-axis. And they want us, um, they say as a function of the total mass, so on the bottom you would have the total mass, which is, I'll just put M sub T, that means the hanging mass plus the effective mass of the spring. So you'll place the total mass there on, on the bottom. And as you plot this, you would expect as my mass increases that my um, time would increase. But because this is squared, 
or sorry, the square root over here. So let me write this off to the side. If I start with our first, to make this more obvious, if I start with this equation of t equals 2 pi m over k underneath the radical. All right, so if I were to square both sides of this equation, just for, I would have 4 pi squared m over k. Now, remember, this mass is the total mass. So I'll put a little t there for that, okay? So if you look at this, you'll notice that t squared is on the y-axis. m sub t is going to be on the x-axis, right? So this is on the y-axis. This is on the x-axis. And if I, let me pick a different color here. There's the y-axis. This is the x-axis, right? So if I... Think back to some, maybe your algebra classes, you would remember y equals mx plus b, and the b here would be zero. So in other words, what this tells me is, is that the slope is going to be equal to, if I were to find, if I were to plot this and do the slope, the slope in this case of this line would be equal to 4 pi squared over k. So in other words, if I take 4 pi squared divided by the slope, that would tell me my spring constant as well. Okay, So that is a, another way we could go ahead and calculate it. In this case, they're not going to have you go that far. They're just simply saying verify that it is a straight line. Okay. All right, so let's go now to the last part, which is the simple pendulum. That's equation number four. Okay, so an even simpler example here of harmonic motion, they say, is a point particle swinging at the end of a massless spring. All right, so what we're going to do in this case, I'm going to remove this pendulum hanger down. Okay, so we have a bit of string here. We're going to assume that it's massless. Um, it's, uh, it is very light, so there's not much mass to that spring at all, uh, to that string, sorry, not spring. Um, <clears throat> and if you have a mass that hangs on the end of a string, so let's say if I place this mass here, okay, then, and I let this oscillate back and forth as a pendulum, like so. Then what we're saying is that if you were to make calculations for this time period, you find an equation that is very similar. So they give you equation 4, okay? Equation 4 says that t is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G. So instead of mass over K, K being a spring constant, in this case, gravity is what is causing the motion, not the spring. And it's gravity only and not the spring itself. And if you look at um, the, um, the mass here, the mass doesn't actually matter. Okay? It did matter for the oscillation earlier. The equation 2 there had mass over um, the spring constant, so the spring strength mattered and the mass mattered. Here we don't have a spring, we only have gravity, so we don't have k in the equation, but we have g. So g being acceleration due to gravity. Then L is going to be the length of this pendulum. So it turns out that in order to affect the, the time it takes for this to swing, the mass does not matter, but the length does. Okay, And that's what they're going to try to get you to see here in a, as few of uh, trials as possible. So if you look at the data table okay, at the bottom of the page, we know the accepted value for g there that they have just above the data table. That's going to be 9.8 meters per second squared. All right. Then you look at the table. And you'll notice something a little strange. In that second column, it has length. You'll see for 1 and 2, it's missing a line. And then mass, you'll see between 2 and 3, it's missing a line. So what they're having you do is in few um, trials as possible, we want to see if the mass or the length matters. Many of these uh, uh, labs that we do, we are giving you the theoretical, mathematical interpretations of what we see in nature. And then we're asking you to verify them and see, are they true or not? And um, so we're telling you that the time period is going to be equal to that equation. And we'll be able to calculate it from that equation. So we'll make the measurements here. We'll calculate the time period. And we're going to see how close are we using um, the stopwatch. All right, so let's just pick a length here. Um, let's say perhaps um, I'll make this a little shorter here so I don't run into the table as much. And I am going to measure the length of this. Ideally, what I would like to do is measure the length from the center of mass. Just looking at this length here, I'm at 
33.1 about. So 33.1 centimeters is going to be my length. So that will be 0 0.331 meters. Okay. Will be my length of the first, and I'm going to vary the mass. All right. So the mass for my first one here is 50 grams. So that will be 0 0.050 kilograms. And we'll go ahead and find the time period for this for oscillation. So I'm going to let it oscillate. I'm going to wait till it comes back to this side to start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 11.79 for 10. So that'll be time period here will be in seconds will be 1.179 seconds. All right. Now, the next thing I want to do is I'm going to keep the length the same, but I'm going to vary the mass. All right. So I'm going to replace this. Let's pick a much heavier mass here. Maybe go four times the mass. So I'm going to put a 200 gram mass on. Okay. So we're keeping the length the same, varying the mass. You give it a small oscillation here. And I'm going to go ahead and write my mass down. So this will be 0.2 kilograms. So start, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, eleven point eight one. So that's one point one eight one. So almost the same time period there um, uh, that we found. So kind of what I'm expecting to see. All right, so now we're going to vary the length. But this time, I'm going to keep the mass the same. So I'll tell you what, let's go out here to a much shorter length. And in this case, I'm going to measure. And of course, when you're looking at percent errors, keep in mind that the mass here is a different length itself. So the center of mass has changed just a little bit. So that um, uh, the in the last um, example we did, the length of the string would have been just slightly longer because this mass would have been slightly longer as well, which would have shifted the center of mass down just a little bit. So if I were making my measurement for the length of that to the halfway point of that mass, then my length would have been slightly longer. And as you notice, we got a slightly longer period, so that's to be expected. Okay, so I see it's about five centimeters, so if I'm down about two and a half here, pretty good. Sorry, I'm going to block you for a minute. So that's 22.5. Uh, so 22.5. So 0.225 meters is my length. Okay, start it oscillating. And we'll go ahead and do it from that side over here. So I'll start. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You'll notice that was moving much quicker here, which gives me a faster time. So 9.53 for 10 which means that my period here is going to be 0 0.953. So exactly what I expected here is that the time period was shorter because I had a shorter length. Okay, so, so far everything I've told you about the equation works out. The last thing you're going to do in the analysis part is you're going to calculate G. So they've already given you the equation there. They've taken the equation from earlier. I think it was equation four in the lab manual. They've already taken that and solved it for G. So in other words, they squared both sides of the equation and uh, then applied algebra to get to where G is equal to four pi squared L over T squared. So you'll take this time period here that's in this fourth column of that bottom table. You'll square that value. You'll take four pi squared times L, which you get from the first column and you'll divide that by the t squared value, okay? And that will give you g. And then finally, you'll be able to do a percent deviation between what you found in, in, uh, in g and then what um, 
what you know it to be is 9.8 is our accepted value, okay? But the one thing that I want to point out is you notice the very last row we have not addressed says large angle, okay? So at this point, I'm just going to simply take the same length and I'm going to take the same mass. But this time, I am going to do a large oscillation. Let's see if I can pull this off here without it hitting. Okay, reset. We're going to go. Let's start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, got 10.37. So you see my time is a little bit different here. That's 1.0. Three, seven. So that large definitely had an effect. You'll calculate G, see how far you are away from uh, percent deviation. Hopefully if, we did a, if I did a good job for you today, then you'll find that the percent deviation between G is going to be a little larger for that last row, for the, um, um, for the large angle one, than for the first three. And that's because the equation that I've been referring to that you're trying to verify if it's correct or not is based on small angles. So when I mentioned earlier with the spring about doing small oscillations, small amplitudes, same thing here. As small amplitudes is based on the small angle approximations um, when they derive those equations. And just to give you a little insight in, into what we have to do in physics sometimes. So, in other words, the small angle allows the equation to be nice, simple, and easy to understand, or relatively easy to understand, so it gives us a more compact equation. Whereas if we include things like very large angles, the equations become much more complicated. So we want you to see that if you go to large angles, then you would have to make some corrections to that theoretical equation that you've used to make the calculations. Okay, so just a little insight into science for you there is the whole reason we have that um, as the last part. Okay, so they ask you a couple of questions there and you'll go through and do the analysis and do your write-up for that as best you can. It's a little different, um, certainly not something we've ever attempted to do before, so um, feel free to contact your TAs and uh, for help and understanding and I hope this video helped.